I want to give you a little bit of a health warning about, about tonight. There's three lectures in this series, and, and tonight is possibly the one that has a little bit of uh, more, uh, has a passage in it which is perhaps a little bit more obscure. I'm venturing onto some territory um, which has some, uh, uh, where I was conscious that um, I might be in dialogue with, with folk in the university from some other disciplines. So if there's a section in the middle of the lecture where you feel like you're glazing over, just glaze over for a few minutes and let it go past you uh, and, and, and tune in again uh, where, it seems, uh, where it seems more relevant. Uh, but hopefully there, there are, uh, the other two lectures I think are, are, are going to uh, uh, land maybe a bit closer to uh, some of the concerns of, of, of the church in Canada and the church in Scotland. Um, in these three lectures, then, I want from within practical theology, uh, liturgy and homiletics, and to a degree also from within missiology and political theology, from within these disciplines, which are the particular ones that I work in, I want to turn our attention towards questions of sense and feeling, affect and emotion. Now, I say I want to uh, turn folks' attention in this direction, but uh, it may well be depending on your own experience and uh, if you're a student or if you work in a university, this may be territory that's very familiar to you and that you have been visiting already for a number of reasons. And, and, and so you may be thinking, well, I wonder when the theologians would discover emotions and start to talk about them. Uh, what I want to offer here is work in progress. And although some of the ideas and preoccupations I'll share have been with me for a long time, I'm still reading my way into what is a huge and expanding literature uh, ranging across multiple disciplines. So I look forward over these days to being questioned, challenged and enlightened by folk here or by folk online who may have specialist knowledge in areas where I'm more of an interested inquirer, uh, visiting floors and corners of the library which are not my usual haunts. I found it hard to know where to begin these lectures, but because they're an exploration as much as an explanation, I've decided to start uh, close to home. Now, uh, practical theologians, I, I, I work in the discipline of practical theology, who are supervising uh, research, qualitative research, might call what I'm about to do uh, a kind of autoethnography. A more down-to-earth Baptist term, which is also more theologically rich, might be witness or testimony. So I want to begin by sharing with you some memories of my own emotional life, and you may find that some of these memories uh, cover territory that is very familiar to some of you. I suspect that will be the case. Some fragments then of my emotional history, of my effective testimony, and I'm not necessarily sharing them because they're all typical or even neurotypical, but because they're mine and I have special access to them and editorial rights over them. So let me give you a little bit of background. I grew up in rural southwest Scotland in a family which was third or fourth generation Plymouth Brethren. Derbyite exclusive Brethren to be exact, which will mean a lot to some of you and nothing to others. The Plymouth Brethren were a kind of early 19th century emerging church group. The origins which John Nelson Darby was part of were in 1820s Dublin in Ireland. Where Darby left his ordained status in the Church of Ireland to meet with a small group who coalesced around the project and that project was turning away from established institutionalized religion and beginning to meet along what they called New Testament lines. Very often when the church tries to reform, uh, people will say, we're just going to do things the way they used to do them in the New Testament. And this was true of the brethren in the 1820s. Now the movement grew rapidly through the 19th century. It experienced the first of what would be a number of splits uh, around the middle of the 19th century. And it split into what became known as exclusive brethren and open brethren wings, and they split over the issue of baptism. So the exclusives continued to baptize infants, which is what Darby had been used to in the Church of Ireland as an Anglican clergyman, but the open brethren uh, began to uh, uh, 
to follow the true path, I'm sure people would say, and to baptize believers upon profession of faith. Darby had a prodigious, if an eccentric intellect. He wrote many hymns. He produced his own translation of the entire Bible. He developed dispensationalist theories. And the eschatological parts of those gave us the concept of the parousia or the second coming of Christ in terms of the rapture, which would later be popularized through the reference notes published with the Schofield Bible. So really, if you've come across rapture theology in your past, and I suspect many Baptists have, then Darby is one of the key people who you owe that to. So, here we are. I'm going to speak about emotion tonight, and uh, I called tonight's lecture All the Feels. And there's a little bit of Whitney Houston, just to kind of um, uh, warm things up. Um, uh, emotion is a complex topic, and it ranges from the very popular. Uh, it's a big theme uh, in popular music. Um, uh, has been uh, in, in many lyrics down through the years. I've got a little emotions playlist on Spotify. I second that emotion. I get so emotional, baby. This was helping me to prepare myself for these lectures. Um, so it ranges from this very popular stream, and these are words and terms and expressions we use every day, to it having become quite an obscure and complex preoccupation of some philosophers and academics in recent years. And we're going to touch on a little bit of both of those things uh, tonight. So first of all, I'm going to do, uh, share some autoethnography, um, some memories of my own emotional history. Derby and Dublin. It's a Sunday morning in November 2019. I'm sitting in Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin. I'm aware this is an ancient Christian site. To use a phrase of T.S. Eliot, prayer has been offered here for almost a thousand years. But the church I'm sitting in is heavily Victorianized. We're worshiping in an Anglo-Catholic style in a building which reflects the tastes and preoccupations of high church Victorian Anglicans. As the service unfolds, in the face of an unimpressive Church of Ireland sermon, I find my thoughts, or is it my feelings, are coalescing around a single realization which has nothing to do with the lectionary readings for the day. I'm just thinking this. Darby was here. Perhaps even ordained here. Maybe not, but he was here. He worshipped here. He walked on these dark green tiles. Perhaps he assisted at communion at that faraway altar at the eastern end where the dean is presiding now. And it was his reaction against all of this, his decision to leave this, his decision against this building and this tradition and these vestments and these rituals and these candles and these inc this incense and that altar. It was his leaving behind of all of this which shaped my life. And for a while I am consumed by this thought, and it is the strangest feeling. Some kind of circuit has just been completed in my life. Some kind of loop has been closed. Perhaps even some kind of ancestor has been encountered. The breaking of bread, a time shift to the 1970s. I am a child in a suit and tie. I'm sitting on a metal framed chair with a green padded vinyl seat. The carpet is a swirl of 1970s abstraction. The ceiling is painted orange. A single story modern hall. It's the new meeting room. A few high thin windows with frosted glass. I'm holding a leather cased John Nelson Darby Bible with a gold brass zip round the edge. It's the morning meeting, the breaking of bread. After I gouge a lump of doughy, hot white bread from the inside of the torn loaf, the cup comes around. It's a glass goblet containing three crowns port. It's passed to me. I'm seven years old. I take a gulp. The glug of sweet alcohol slips down my throat. I feel a surge of warmth, a slight dizziness. Is this the Holy Spirit, I wonder? <laughs> Is this what it feels like to love Jesus? 
to be saved. It feels strange, but not unpleasant. <laughs> Trying to get saved. The same room, but it's Sunday evening. I can feel what seems like an endless sequence of Sunday evening gospel preachings blurring into one another. And somehow they all make their way to the same challenge, sometimes blurted out nervously, sometimes thundered out aggressively, sometimes offered winsomely in a pleading invitation. If the Lord Jesus returned tonight, would you be left behind? I am appalled at this thought and disturbed, and not just once, but almost every time I try once again to give my heart to Jesus and ask him to come in. The handle is on the inside of the door, after all. Only I can reach it just as I am. But has it worked? I don't feel like it can have worked the first time, the last time, maybe even the times in between. Don't trust your feelings, the preachers sometimes say. But what else do I have to go on? And it's good feelings I'm being promised, love, joy, peace, assurance. Sure, I'll try the sinner's prayer again, and I'll try even harder to mean it tonight. Feeling rapture. The same town, but a Saturday night. We've been at the town summer festival celebration in the park by the loch, and we stayed for the fireworks. But I have lost my parents and my brothers in the crowd. I look and I look, and then I run home half a mile, and the house is dark and empty. Immediately I know what has happened. The rapture has happened, and I have been left. I didn't do the prayer right. I knew this was likely. I never really felt Jesus had properly come into my heart. I run again another three quarters of a mile, sobbing, terrified. My uncle is the main leader in our assembly. If it's happened, he and my aunt will be gone too. Lungs bursting, I get to their door. The lights are on. They're both there. They phone my house where everyone is back now. False alarm. This is not it. The tribulation will not happen just yet. I feel too foolish explain. You see, I thought that and I sob instead. But there are other nights, nights when it's just that the house is too quiet and I wake. And I do go through and I check my parents' beds. My little brother's no guarantee. He too could have, he could have been left just like me. Sorry, Chaz. How can you trust your feelings, I think? They make me want to get saved, but they also make me doubt I am saved. They make me afraid. I love my mom and dad. I don't want to get left behind. The same town, power cuts. It's the year of the miners' strike. There are power cuts. Our family are all together in the kitchen. My father has lit candles. For hours we sit as the flames flicker and the shadows dance on the walls. It is so beautiful. We are not the kind of family that ever light candles. I've never been in the room which felt like this. Beautiful and holy. But the miners are bad. Some of them are communists. My dad says Mick McGahey should be shot. But if it wasn't for him, I would never have known this. This flickering, golden, shadowy, soft, focused beauty. The Shame and the Switchblade. I've been reading The Cross and the Switchblade by David Wilkerson, a thrilling account of his gangland ministry in Brooklyn, New York. Later, I'm given another book by Wilkerson on teenage discipleship. He disapproves very strongly of Christian boys who engage in self-abuse. Pray for the strength to resist, he says. Jesus will help you to resist any temptation. Wilkerson is a hero to me. This feeling, this feeling is being a 14-year-old boy. This feeling is... Shame, this feeling is failure, this feeling is sex, this feeling is shame. Guitars. The exclusive brethren never had guitars or any kind of music, just our voices, so it was weird when we read the Psalms, but that was in the old dispensation. After Jesus, there was no musical accompaniment because of the Holy Spirit. 
after the big split, after the scandal, after our church all fell apart, I was allowed to go to the youth rally at the Open Brethren meeting in Dumfries. The Open Brethren had guitars. They sang, Bind Us Together, Lord. It was like a door opening into a new world for me. Worship with guitars was everything. From their record library, I borrowed Larry Norman. I want the people to know that he saved my soul, but I still like to listen to the radio. When I was up in Canada, I didn't have much money. I feel good every day because Jesus is the rock and he rolled my blues away. In our assembly, they told me there were satanic messages on the recording secretly hidden so we shouldn't listen to them. But that felt wrong to me. It felt like there was something wrong in those people making them say that, not something wrong in the music. I feel like maybe Jesus loves guitar music just like I do. Tazy. It's the early 1980s. The train pulls into Maconville. It's early September, pleasantly hot. I walk up the hill with my two evangelical interrailing friends. We stand in line and work out where to stay and where to eat. A service is starting. People have left their shoes outside of the tent. I have never taken my shoes off before to go and worship. I feel like Moses. We sit down beside 2,000 folk my age from many different countries. A monk in a simple habit walks to the center where there is a single microphone. He divides all 2,000 of us into four groups and teaches us a simple Latin chant in four parts. When we all sing together, I am completely overwhelmed with the beauty of it. It is like I have walked through the gates of heaven. I never want it to end. I feel like I have been totally immersed in music. So I'm tempted to end that little sequence of emotional memories, memories of emotion with a very 21st century phrase, one my daughters might use, albeit with a helping of irony. All the feels. I could go on. Once I started, it was hard to know where to stop, how I felt the first time I heard someone pray in tongues. How I felt the first time I heard a black majority church in East London sing with a Hammond B organ and a massive offbeat with the whole room beginning to move as one. The first time I attended an Ash Wednesday service and received ashes on my head. It's a different kind of personal history. If I chart my faith journey through this, it's like a kind of seismology or barometry of the emotions. Perhaps one thing that becomes clear is that this is no kind of straightforward process of giving testimony. The work of recalling these emotions and these experiences is visceral. I'm engaged in what William Reddy calls the work of the navigation of feeling, the translation of feeling. And the work of autoethnography, like the work of exegeting the scriptures, is not a case of giving a definitive final reading. It's like a hermeneutical pass at a group of emotions and experiences and memories. It's not the last word, it's not the final say. For those of us who are preachers, it's a bit like revisiting a familiar text. We find we're never done with reading it. In a different light, in a different decade, in a different company, in a different continent, we can discover new things. Some things will snap into focus and some things will blur into confusion. Begin to read around, this is the obscure part coming up now. Begin to read around the science of emotions and you will find it is bewilderingly dissonant and contested. US psychology professor Lisa Feldman Barrett says emotions are guesses. We're constantly working on them, working out what to make of them. And she says we're in fact constantly making them. Feldman Barrett adopts what she calls a Darwinian constructionist perspective to understanding emotion. And she disagrees profoundly with the old typological approach espoused by the likes of Ekman in his landmark studies, in which he identified a limited number of natural kinds of emotional responses. I think there was six or seven classically in Ekman's scheme. 
She's unconvinced by this awkward construal of biological regularities into kind of platonic forms. Ruth Lees, professor of humanities at John Hopkins University, wrote this in a 2011 article. She said, I want to consider the turn to the emotions that has been occurring in a broad range of fields, including history, political theory, human geography, urban and environmental studies, architecture, literary studies, art history and criticism, media theory and cultural studies. So that's quite a lot of Acadia University represented here, where if you went and spoke to people, I think you would find that they would begin to nod and say, yes, folk in our discipline have begun to talk a lot about emotion and affect in the past five to 10 years. For anyone working within the academy today, it's clear that the turn to affect and emotion, which Lees, desc Lees describes, is a real and a widespread phenomenon. Now, watching academic behavior and intellectual trends across universities can be a bit like watching flocks of migrating birds engaged in murmuration. A less attractive and graceful metaphor might be the idea of a pack of hounds trying to pick up a scent. But in each case, there's a moment when it becomes clear that people are onto something, and a good many of them think that they should head off in the same direction. It's not so long ago that both within the academy and within many church gatherings and seminars, you couldn't move without hearing the word postmodern. But as we edged our way into the 21st century, that language and conceptuality began to slip away from us. It wasn't like a very conscious decision. It was more like people suddenly deciding they weren't going to wear flares anymore, or the melting away of punk rock, or moving on from the Toronto blessing. But if observing these intellectual murmurations might introduce some healthy skepticism, we should have the humility also to recognize that we never get to stand back and just watch the starlings. We are always somehow in there flying around ourselves and we have to work out what's going on from the inside as we too are turning and turning in the widening gyres, checking in with each other about what we can see from where we are. If there are still some very deep theoretical and conceptual divisions running within the academic study of affect and emotion, then we might need to think hard about before we pick sides as we enter this conversation. So in what's left of this lecture, I want to do th two things. I want to briefly note some of what I think is at stake in these contemporary debates. And then I want to spend a bit more time at the end reflecting on where and how the churches and their theologians might benefit from taking more account of affect and emotion in relation to their own concerns and practices. So, what's at stake in these debates? My first point would be that despite the need for caution and maybe skepticism about fashions that develop within universities and academic uh, communities, this turn to affect and emotion is interested. Practical theology is by its nature interested in what people do and how people behave, what they actually do, not necessarily what they should do um, or what they think they should do, but how they behave. We're always interested in that. And one of its working assumptions, I think, is that when people begin to behave in certain ways, even if those, th those ways turn out to be more or less wrong-headed, um, th the way they behave may be meaningful. It may say something about what's going on in their society and what's going on in their culture. The fact that we don't talk so much about, about being postmodern anymore implies that we have distanced ourselves from the intellectual premises and dynamics which fed that language. But it also means that we can now say, what was that all about? What was going on? Why did we all, for a few years, feel that every paper we wrote and every book that was published and every talk we gave had to include somehow that reference in it. Why was that language so important for many of us? And similarly, within this turn to affect and emotion, as we engage this conversation, we might also hear the Spirit speaking to the churches. So one question might be, why does this feel necessary to so many disciplines at this moment in time? A second thing is that there's something about this turn uh, which is also constituting part of an intellectual push out from postmodernism and poststructuralism. Now we need to be careful here 
um, because some of those who are working on affect theory, I would say, still stand rather closer to that language and that conceptuality. And I'm thinking if this means anything to any of you about, about the work of people like Brian Masumi and Eve Sedgwick, nod or wave to me if those names mean anything to you. I'm not getting a lot from the room here. Um, but those are big uh, names in affect theory at the moment within the academy. And then we could contrast that with another uh, major figure, the historian and anthropologist William Reddy, and in particular his 2001 book called The Navigation of Feeling, a framework for the history of emotions. Within these debates, we see a fascinating conversation developing between empirical psychology, history, anthropology, and philosophy. Now, as I say, we have retreated within the university from peak postmodern talk, peak deconstruction talk, um, and away from some of the really desperately obscure language and writing styles that were associated with that for a while. There seems to be a hunger for a renewed purchase on the world. There's a return to people citing the empirical and the experimental, which was very out of fashion in the arts for a while. There's a desire to focus on the material, on material culture, on visual culture, on the body, and through the body on affect and emotion, on feeling and on the senses. No one is completely forgetting or regretting the postmodern turn, but there are signs both of some people reversing back out of now what, what is now seen to be a cul-de-sac and of others shifting their bearings in ways that head back towards the old highway they first turned off of. So the cold winds of deconstruction have sent folk back to have some new conversations about construction, about the social construction of cultures and emotions. There are some complex dynamics at work here, which relate to a wider intellectual and political landscape. For the newly emboldened and indignant forces of what I would call radical conservatism, and they've just lost one of their intellectual heroes with the death of the philosopher Roger Scruton, there is a determination to throw off the shackles of what they call the woke left and the shame filters that came with that. We might suggest that Jordan Peterson is a kind of poster boy of this group. And some of them feel that in a world which is currently championing Putin, Orban, Trump and Brexit, their time has come. And perhaps there are theological analogues and allies here from the Gospel Coalition to the Benedict Option. This is a group which scores high on both affect and testosterone, high on carbon footprint and outrage, and low on eumelanin. A more mediating stance could be associated with the work of scholars such as Charles Taylor in philosophy, William Reddy in history and anthropology. In theology, we might want to add in Rowan Williams and Catherine Tanner, a Canadian example of a mediating position might be James K.A. Smith. And this stream could be characterised as post-liberal in certain ways, sharing concerns about the ways in which constructionist thought has created major problems of social determinism and moral relativism. But they're not in the backlash uh, uh, trend of the first stream, and they remain highly conscientised about issues of gender and racism and colonialism. I've already mentioned those who could be called the radical or the emergent affect theorists. And if you look at the affect theory reader, which is one of the main uh, publications people um, are citing at the moment, um, then you'll see this is the main editorial approach behind the work that they're doing. Um, this, the feel and the style of their work retains much of the self-consciousness and the difficulty and the density of the postmodern and post-structuralist writers, but there's a new appetite for messiness and materiality. And so the theoretical orientations are often esoteric and eclectic. So Masumi, for example, draws on process thought, emergence theory, uh, the Deleuzian mix of the metaphysical and the psychoanalytical alongside experimental psychology. And then I hesitate to include a category called the non-aligned, um, although that label has its own political history uh, within international relations and global politics. But I want to use it here to indicate the ways in which I feel certain kinds of radical perspectives, particularly some of the post-colonial constructionist perspectives within anthropology and some of the liberationist approaches within theology are resisting being assimilated to any of the above and preferring rather to remain between some of the theoretical and the philosophical dilemmas that Reddy identifies. 
So perhaps surprisingly, the turn to emotion and affect has become a site at which some key philosophical debates are being explored. And although some of these are highly complex, I would argue that they're important for the churches and their theologians to stay abreast of, not least because the overlap of philosophical and sociological and political concerns mean that they're hot spots where key questions are spilling over and mapping onto hotly contested social and political uh, debates and practices, in particular around racism and gender theory and environmental activism. Okay, so that's the, the kind of more obscure part of the lecture, and we're going to try and uh, return uh, to more familiar territory. And the final part of the lecture, I want to try and identify where these questions impact in more concrete ways on the distinctive concerns and practices of the Christian churches. And this is where I hope you might sense some connections back to the stories I told to the autoethnographic moments from the beginning of the lecture. In other words, this is about how we understand ourselves, our own lives, our own journeys, our witness and testimony as believers and as churches. If we were sent away tomorrow and asked to do an audit of the whole life and work of now here I would normally say the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, but if I said instead Acadia Divinity School, if we were asked to audit the work of Acadia Divinity School, bearing in mind questions of affect and emotion, what might that do to us? What would it reveal to us about ourselves and where would it I feel, appear to have some purchase? Or to put it another way and to ask another question, how does it feel to be Baptist? And how do Baptists feel about things? Suppose we started with systematic theology and we read our traditions for affect and emotion. Well, we might begin to think of Augustine developing an effective model of the Trinity. We might think of Moltmann's work on the crucified God and then a rather strong pushback within more recent theology to reaffirm the impassibility of God. We might think of Japanese theologian Kosuke Koyama talking about Yahweh being a hot God, not a cool God, and a slow God, not a fast God. We might draw on the resources of religious art to consider the ways in which the passions and the affections of the Saviour have been depicted down through the centuries. Or we might do that through our study of hymnody. So we could pick a section of one of the Baptist hymnals and analyse the affective language, the emotion language applied to God. What kind of emotions does God have? If we moved on to pneumatology and the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, things would really begin to get busy. Our understanding of the work of the Spirit in soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, or where would that take us? The conviction of sin, the sense of being drawn to Christ, lifted up on the cross for our salvation. Our awareness of the nature of God, which arises from our reflection on the creation around us. Our awareness of being first loved by God and then loving God in return. Our experience of receiving the Spirit and of sanctification, perhaps of being strangely warmed, as John Wesley famously said. We could then make another trawl through Baptist hymn books and through our repertoire of contemporary worship songs and begin to explore not how effective language is applied to God, but how the affections of believers are represented in these songs and hymns. Now, another crucial area would be theological anthropology, in other words, the doctrine of the human person. And I'll say more about that tomorrow night, particularly in response to the work of James K. E. Smith. But for tonight, what are little boys made of? How do we describe the constitution of human beings? Body, mind, spirit, soul? Where do emotions fit into that? And how did we do this in the past? Well, let's bring on the church historians and the missiologists and the feminist and the womanist and the Mujerista theologians and the African-Canadian theologians of black liberation and the theologians of indigenous experience. And let's bring them all on because it turns out there is a whole history here of how different kinds of people were described in relation to emotion. Some particularly white Latinized European males were seen as particularly highly endowed with reason. Others, particularly women and people of color and First Nations people, 
were seen as being much more the creatures and the victims of their passions. Women were too emotional to be ordained, to be allowed to preach or to lead or to vote. People of color were animated by savage passions and lacked the civilizing light of reason which God had providentially given to the genocidal colonizers and empire builders. Now let's involve the biblical studies department. Emotion and affect in the Hebrew Bible. What are the emotion words that are applied to Yahweh? Emotion words applied to God's covenant partners, Israel. How does Israel feel towards God? What about emotion and affect in the wisdom literature? What about the attributions of emotion in the Bible to different genders? Do men feel one way and women feel another way? What about the affective swings of the rapist Amnon? What about emotion and the affect in the Psalms and the prophets? Delight and awe and rage and lament. What about rhetorical analysis of particular scripture passages where we look at the, the emotional dynamics? For example, the scripture I'm preaching on here in uh, Wolfville on Wednesday from Deuteronomy 30. Extraordinary emotional dynamics in the uh, invitation uh, that, that is issued by Moses to the people to choose life. Or in the Pauline epistles, what about Jesus and Paul and their broody maternal feelings? Look it up. Or let's move sideways to hermeneutics, to how people read and interpret biblical texts. Now, as you know, Baptists, just like Presbyterians, always read and interpret the Bible in a cool, rational, and dispassionate way, which is marked by light rather than heat. Or maybe we don't. Think about the most divisive hermeneutical debates since the Reformation, theologies of the Lord's Supper, debates between Calvinists and Arminians, you were destined to be wrong about those. <laughs> Debates about holiness theology, an affective reading of Romans 6 and 7. Can the ransomed soul escape what Augustine called our disordered loves, or do they still coexist even in the regenerate woman? Or think of eschatology, the way in which a big affect word, rapture, came to mean both being carried away emotionally and carried away bodily to meet Christ in the air. Or think about debates around the ministry of woman. Marked both by the attribution of excessive emotion to woman and also by such as John Piper citing his own affective response to viewing a woman's body while she's teaching him. Or think about the painful and the divisive issues many churches have experienced around same-sex relationships. And here, it's clear that the way in which people have interpreted scripture have included strong emotional reactions. Disgust, shame, maybe even repressed desire. I've already mentioned that emotion and affect is a key concern for the study of liturgy and worship, um, uh, Professor Blythe's area here. Um, and I'm going to say more about that area in tomorrow night's lecture when we focus on liturgy and worship. So let's move to the pastoral theologians. Well, this is going to be a major theme for them, isn't it? How could it not be? Understandings of emotional literacy. How the church has sometimes suffered from emotionally illiterate leaders, mostly but not only men. But also the crucial role of affect and emotion in relation to mental health and well-being. Not just what our little boys made of, but how do they and little girls feel about themselves? How does it feel to be you? Your gender, your age, your body, your sexual orientation, your state of health? How does discipleship relate to well-being and self-esteem? Think about the growing literature around how pastoral care responds to trauma. One famous book on trauma is called The Body Keeps the score. Or think of one of the most heated and potentially confusing pastoral and ethical areas in contemporary society, debates around trans identity. Whether we use the language of dysphoria or simply of resisting binaries and insisting on fluidity, 
This is an extraordinarily powerful example of what Reddy and others call cog motion. In other words, where emotion and cognition are combined to make profound claims, ontological claims about who I am. So for trans people saying who I am on the inside is not who I have been assigned to be on the outside. We could see this as a disconcerting new example of what we've sometimes called testimonium internum. So which is the reliable guide to who we are and how do we decide? Or we could talk about congregational studies, mapping the aff affective life of a congregation. I come from the massively schismatic Plymouth Brethren tradition. People were always separating from one another as well as separating from the world. Think about the emotional dimensions of church meetings and deacons' courts and congregational boards. There are some Baptist feelings involved in that, I guess. But think also of the deep Baptist legacy of peacemaking and reconciliation with its roots in Anabaptist practices and principles. My final area is mission and public witness. In an age of rapid secularization where many people are not feeling much like coming to church, certainly in Scotland, an age of populism and nationalism, an age where Pentecostalism is a major growth area in the global church, an age where neo-fascist groups are mobilizing across Europe on a scale not seen for decades. Those are questions I'm gonna say more about in my third lecture. But how do we uh, relate uh, questions of mission and public witness uh, to emotion and affect? I'm aware that I have, may have become a little bit listy there and approximate, um, but let me close why, by saying why I did it. I wanted tonight to note something which feels like a significant move. I called it a murmuration within the academy across a range of disciplines. And I wanted to reflect on what may be going on with that, uh, within that and why it might be important for us to pay attention and to get involved in it. I wanted to demonstrate with some autoethnographic examples how deeply questions of affect and emotion reach into our own formation, into our own sense of who we are and what our witness is as Christians and what our testimony is as disciples of Jesus Christ to how life is for us. I then walked through at the end through some key curriculum areas and gave a range of examples as a way of illustrating the question which I'm putting to myself and sharing with you in these lectures. And that question is, is this an area which is under-theorized and under-theologized and under-attended to in our theological work? What happens to your area of interest or practice or study when you put this Snapchat filter on it, when you say, let's think about emotions and talk about emotions. Let's talk about how this feels. What is it that comes into focus more sharply if that's the question you ask? Which gaps and omissions reveal themselves? Which biases and prejudices and assumptions become more noticeable and more troubling? As a practical theologian, I would say that those of you who are, who are Baptists are practicing being Baptists just like I'm practicing being Presbyterian. So what is the Spirit saying to the churches as we practice? Maybe, how does it feel? Maybe, why does it feel like that? Maybe as the African-American womanist thinker Ruby Sales says, the key question is where does it hurt? Or maybe for us low church, low affect Presbyterians at least, the spirit is saying once more with feeling. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, oh, huge amount of territory, eh? And uh, an opportunity for, for people to, to bring some of their questions. If you want to do that, we are asking that you make use of the microphone. I, I know we can hear you in the room if you shout loud enough, 
but we're asking to use the microphone for the benefit of the people who are following this uh, online, because that is a way in which they can pick up some of the questions. And we will have an opportunity to pick up some of the, the questions that have come online, uh, either via Anna or John. I'm not quite sure who will manage that. Uh, and while you, you think about that and, and frame your question, so, so Doug, I, I used to serve in a church where my, I'm just doing the warm up, uh, the, the comment that would frequently be made is feelings are fickle. Uh, so what is the response to that? Are, is, are you saying feelings are important? Are they more than fickle? Uh, or Because that, that was a constant, regular, taught issue from uh, the pulpit. Feelings are fickle. So how would you respond to that in terms of where you see the conversation going? Because I know that what you've been trying to point out is a, a, a conversation on so many different levels, and some of them levels of controversy, are, are deeply issues around feeling. No, I, I, it's a great question, and and I was taught the same thing, you know, and and uh, so I, I talked to you about what if you grow up in a fundamentalist household, um, or even just a, a very warm-hearted, uh, pious household. Uh, and there was constant urging to give your heart to Jesus, then I think my experience when I'm talking about being seven, eight, nine years old and feeling that I wasn't sure whether it had really worked and whether I really was saved anymore. I'm not the only person that kind of get witness in the room. To, I'm not the only person who felt that. And so actually sometimes this felt like really wise, good pastoral advice, people saying, well, it's not all just all about your feelings, you know, and you, you, feelings are fickle things and they do change. And so there was an attempt about that, I think, which was wise pastoral advice, trying to get you not just to, to, to rely on how you felt on any given day in any given moment. I think there's something good about that. But I also think that, that there was something about that which, which reflected a kind of unease about what to do with feelings. Uh, and, and because of that, I, th I think it's one of the reasons people haven't taken them very seriously. Um, and so what happened then, I think, would be you would get a situation where people, and lots of folk in this room have probably had moments in their life when either uh, for reasons which would be labeled to do with mental health or uh, uh, where they've experienced uh, difficult times or disappointment or loss or tragedy um, or whatever, um, where they've been very aware of how significant feelings were in their life. And I'm just not sure that we were always good enough at paying attention to those. So there was a bit of a division whereby, well, maybe you then go and speak to the therapist about that. You know, the therapists are the people who know how to talk about feelings. Um, uh, whereas, um, so that was one thing. I'm not sure that we, were, that we took feelings seriously enough and emotions uh, seriously. Uh, in, enough, um, and, and I think there was good pastoral instincts in, in people saying that, uh, but I think it had some uh, negative consequences as well. And uh, so I think the idea of, of, of saying, well, well, what happens when you begin to focus rather deliberately on this topic? Um, and actually, the, the range of examples I gave, I think we could probably go around the room and, and people could tell. It would be interesting if you did a kind of emotions diary, if you did a graph and said, what were the key moments in your life when, um, and, and, and then to say, so how good is it to try and evangelize and do children's work based on a fear of separation and, and fueling separation anxiety between children, young children and their parents? That was very effective, you know. It certainly made me want to pray the sinner's prayer over and over again. Was it healthy? Was it pastorally wise? Was it good practice? to evangelize children, young people like that? I don't think it was. And maybe if we'd thought a bit more about emotional health and emotional sense, uh, then people uh, would have had a different attitude towards uh, some of those, those questions. So it's a yes and a no in a sense. And I think, I think it's, it, it, I'm not saying it's not a good pastoral thing to say sometimes to people, but I wonder whether it's also contributed to a lack of serious attention uh, towards uh, feelings um, uh, explicit attention. In fact, feelings never. Feelings just continue to to surface all the time in our lives in lots of different ways. It's just that I don't think we're very good at talking about them.
you want. I, I have a pile. I'm ready to go now. So uh, I, I, I would get up. Uh, if, if you want to kind of ask a question, make your way to the microphone uh, or we'll pick up. But one more before we go there. So in response to that, two, two, two questions. One would be, how, how does that thing called the assurance of the Holy Spirit fit into that, which would often be a response to, I, I don't feel that I've been converted. And one of the things would be the assurance of the Holy Spirit. That assurance of the Holy Spirit would be suggested through reference to Scripture as addressing feelings. What role do you think Scripture has in addressing feelings? As a corrective, as affirming? How would that, that's a very Baptist question. How does the Bible respond to some of, I feel this? And we say, yeah, but the scripture says this. So how does that, these things relate? It's a, it's a great question and it's a complicated question, but I, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in the second lecture. Um, but there's a sense in which I, th I do think that, that um, so if, uh, some of the, the psychological literature and some of the sociological literature around emotion and feeling would think a lot about how feelings are constructed. And that would, in the m more recent decades, would, would say that, that that construction takes place in lots of complicated ways. In other words, we, we learn to feel in certain ways. Uh, some of you might have see, seen, there's a very common thing that was in lots of nurseries in the UK. Um, I think it was the U UNICEF or, or children learn what they live with. Have you ever seen that? If they live with, you know, fear, they, they and in a way that's adopting a kind of constructionist approach to, to emotion. It's seeing that, that the way, you know, if, 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 and we all know people like that, people who, who maybe lived with a bullying parent who constantly, or a bullying spouse who constantly told them uh, that they were hopeless or they were useless, they were no good. Um, and, and so people then kind of internalize and learn to feel. So I suppose, you know, in the positive sense, what we'd want to say is, is that in terms of the construction and the formation of feeling, um, when we talk about discipleship and working with scripture, that's one of the things we're trying to do is we're, we're talking about educating and forming our emotions in certain ways. And so we're learning to feel within the company of God's people uh, under the influence of the Holy Spirit as we engage with Scripture. And so um, we learn a set of cues and a certain set of ways of understanding the world. And, and as we go on through life, those are tested. And so we go into new situations um, and we say, those ways of understanding myself, that, you know, for example, that, that um, uh, Jesus Christ has, has died for my salvation and that I am forgiven uh, and reconciled to God through his death on the cross um, and, and that I have been given the Holy Spirit. Um, does that seem to carry on fitting my experience of life somehow? I do think at some point it's fine, fine to say don't just trust your feelings but if you never get any emotional feedback at all if you never have any sense of the presence of God, if you never feel any sense of assurance, uh, then that would be tricky for you, I think, because that would begin to feel that it was counting against this being true and this being real. And so I think at some point there has to be some sense of Christian experience being part of a kind of feedback loop that these things are true and that they are real. And the process of encountering Scripture would be a way of trying to see these are the kind of things that you should be feeling if this is true and if this is real. You know, having said that, that also depends on whether people are interpreting Scripture well and in a balanced way. And as we know, that doesn't always happen within the church. And sometimes people go overboard in certain things. Um, so some people grew up in churches um, uh, where... Um, there's, a, there's a lovely line, if you, I don't know if you read Marilyn Robinson's novels, Gilead and Home... And, and Leela, and there's a lovely, th th there are kind of extended meditations on the story of the prodigal son, really. And uh, uh, the, the, the prodigal son in this case is Jack, who has, has gone into all kinds of problems. And there's a story where um, uh, she talks about her father who's a minister, and whenever Jack occasionally comes back and appears at the back of the church, and she says, and then no matter what the text was, the sermon would always become about the love and the grace and the mercy of God. It's a lovely little passage there. Well, some of us grew up with that, but other people grew up, I think, being reminded how, how 
rotten they were and how sinful they were uh, a, a lot of the time. So both of those are possibly ways of educating uh, and forming your emotions from Scripture. That becomes complicated as well. It depends how people are using Scripture and applying it. what some of the things that you've said are, are the, the, just recently, how would you respond to Mother Teresa's po post posthumous letters in which she claims that she never ever felt the warmth, the reality, the presence of God in her life, and yet for some reason her ministry was sustained over decades Well, I, I think that it's a really complicated question. It's very difficult to, to see into someone else's soul. So I can only speculate on what that kind, something like that might be like, if I, if I, what the possible reasons for I mean, the first thing is to say, I think it must have been extraordinarily difficult for her then to carry on doing what she did if she felt so little. Um, I mentioned the book about trauma, The Body Keeps the Score. Um, she was exposed to enormous amounts of suffering uh, and pain uh, through what she did. Um, and it's possible maybe that sometimes uh, in order to cope with that level of distress that, that parts of your system kind of shut down in certain ways. And it may be that some of the things that help you to keep going also um, constrict some of the other areas of sensitivity. Uh, so it may be that there was a kind of price she paid uh, for doing that. Uh, my wife is a clinical psychologist. She's retired after 35 years. Much of the time she's been working with victims of abuse and, and, and latterly with uh, refugees and asylum seekers, many of whom have been through traumatic experiences so um, and I remember her, co her coming home one day and she said I've had to sit and listen today to things that no one should ever have had to listen to but she said because but it's because people have those people have gone through things that no one should ever have had to go through um, so um, but I mean I think it's a, it's a very sad thing uh, you know to, to have read that from Mother Teresa but I, that's just a speculation I think it is possible in some people's experience that the thing that helps them to keep going uh, possibly also cauterizes uh, some of the things that might help them to have felt more positive things as well but that's a bit speculative it's a, it's a powerful a disturbing question Um, I'm Clarence, and I think that uh, I really appreciated what you said. Uh, and one of the things in uh, my work and in my spiritual life, I've been really influenced by um, non-Protestants, followers of Jesus, but some of the teachings in other areas. What, what I find so uh, evident in our walk, it seems that so many people are afraid of going to places where, um, uh, here's an emotional word, we create uh, emotional intimacy or intimacy around what we're suffering. One of my favorite passages is blessed are the poor in spirit because I think that's kind of the heart of it. What, what's your sense of what this fear is and how do we, um, how do we kind of help people say, let go of that fear and, and be more emotional in our churches? Um, and I've been influenced by Henry Now and Jean Vanier about places where we feel like we really belong, especially for the marginalized. Yeah, this is a really unhelpful thing to see, but I'm going to talk quite a lot about that tomorrow in the second lecture. But I, I, I and specifically, I'm going to talk about um, a particular uh, service and a particular ritual where I think people do that. But. Um, uh, 
I mean, again, I think that's that's a that's a complicated thing, and it depends on lots of things. It depends on whether, in a sense, uh, we create church as a safe environment, um, and including it being a safe environment for people to be honest in. And one of the things I'm going to talk about in the final uh, lecture is about intercessory prayer. The things that we are prepared to pray about publicly in church and the things that we don't. Even the words that we might use and the words that we might not be prepared to use. And I think that's very important because I think that models the kind of... Now, uh, church is not a place to wash your dirty linen in public and people need to be appropriately defended and they shouldn't just spill their guts in front of other people. You know, you've got, to, you've got to be in control to some extent of what you disclose to other people. But also, if you can create church as a safe space, and particularly for men, I think this is a big issue. In Scotland, um, there's a big campaign uh, uh, around male mental health at the moment. Uh, the suicide rate for young men in Scotland is much higher than it is for young women. And the working hypothesis, I think, of most people in mental health is it's because men find it very difficult to talk about their feelings to other men when things are going wrong. And so the campaign's just focused around it's okay not to be, you know, actually Prince Harry's been doing a lot about it. Um, uh, you're welcome to Harry and Meghan, by the way, we've just uh, <laughs> exported them to you. Um, uh, uh, no, uh, and... and but I, I think they've done lots of good things, actually, and I'm, I, that's another topic. We could talk about them leaving the UK and what's going on. I think there's lots of shameful things in the UK about what has driven them out. Um, but anyway, one of the good things they've done, I think, is a focus on, on mental health and uh, on saying it's okay not to be okay, and it's okay for men in particular to admit uh, that things are difficult. Um, and. Uh, as opposed to what people usually do, which is either just to repress it or to medicate it with alcohol uh, or, or with drugs. Um, and I think trying to create churches as, as safe spaces where it's okay to talk about things like that. Um, in my experience, people, preachers very rarely preach about mental health. They very rarely talk about it from the pulpit. Um, a lot of the time, the prayers, the intercessory prayers, are what I tell my students not to pray seven, four, seven prayers where you're cruising 20,000 feet above the earth and say, Lord, we just pray for all those who are suffering and all those who are poor and all those who are... And, and actually, intercessory prayers are meant to be a time when we begin to model empathy and an understanding of what might be difficult in one another's lives. And that means we need to be concrete, we need to be specific, and we need to talk about particular emotions. Um, and so... Actually, if our churches are going to be safe places where we can have that kind of intimacy and, and, and vulnerability and care for one another, then we're going to have to model it in the language of the pulpit and in the language in which we lead prayer, as well as the language of pastoral care. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, in your first part of your journey, I mean, you went from monks to speaking in tongues to Anglo-Catholic worship. And what strikes me is exposing yourself to different uh, Christian cultures. And um, it, makes, it made me think of an experience I had where one, when I was studying in Toronto, in the morning we went to a very straight-laced, pretty much upper-middle-class white evangelical church. In the evening, my friend said, let's go to this Pentecostal church. The band held a, a note forever, and everybody just made up their own song in whatever tongue or language or whatever, and it went on for yeah. three or four minutes, right? And this is my first experience, and I said, interesting. So, you know, I wonder if part of tying this in with missiology, if part of our missiology needs to be sending our worship pastors or our choir members or just regular members to every... Uh, emotional expression of Christianity that we can to understand different cultures to see w how do we if we're not doing it if we don't have the the language or the experience how do we learn from other people so I'm wondering if you see that as a, a form a, a combination of liturgy plus missiology in the sense of of uh, learning from others yeah that's a, that's a great question and I think that um, I, I mean I think 
taking people into different worship contexts is very important and, and I think exposing them to different styles of worship. But within that, the important thing, the, the, the jargon we use all the time in, in, in practical theology is people becoming reflective practitioners. In other words, people have got to be able to reflect thoughtfully on, on their own practice and what they're doing and on the experiences. Um, so a lot of the work we're doing with, I'm, I'm doing with ordinands with people who are trained to be ministers is saying, what's going on here? You know, um, and, so, uh, and, and how would we tell? For example, um, you could get a, 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 a form of worship which seemed very emotionally restrained and not very much was going on, but it could, because of all sorts of other reasons within that community, be a very emotionally healthy space. And you could go somewhere else where it felt very free and immersive and, and, and uh, uh, like everything was, was, was going right and there could be all kinds of uh, emotional turbulence within that community as well. So it's, it's trying to say, well, how, how do we... How do we talk about what's going on there? And in worship and liturgy, it's very interesting. And this is maybe, again, for, for a Baptist school, as for us with a Presbyterian school. A lot of the academic study of worship and liturgy related to um, traditions which had books, liturgical books. And it's focused on how those books were developed and, and, and the, the history of, of those things. Um, it, there's far less, and it's, it's easy to see why, if you go to a church where people just stand up and they make up prayers, you know, like I grew up in the Brethren, you know, and there was no books, nobody wrote down prayers, that would have been a deeply disapproved of. That, that sort of thing is actually in a way much harder to study, it's much harder to analyse and to reflect on. Um, and so people learn to pray by copying other people. Um, and so they pick up lots of bad habits as well as lots of good habits. So I think trying to help people to reflect carefully on worship practice, and I think we need to find new ways to do that in relation to churches where there isn't a script and there isn't a text. Um, so we need to be able to say, okay, what was your Pentecostal church? Uh, you know, let, let's, let's try and, and maybe there'll be a video or maybe there'll be a recording or maybe we'll just sit and take some notes and then, then begin to reflect on what was good about that. Um, and, and, um, and also teaching people, in a sense, not to be afraid of one another's traditions. And to ha even, even if something ends up not being really my style, if I can understand and respect why people are doing certain things uh, and, and what that means for them, uh, uh, then that might just enable me to be more generous in and, 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 and my understanding of what's going on. Um, and also to understand... Uh, my own style and my own preferences. Uh, the big tendency that we always have, I think, within the church is where something is different. Uh, we, we often f apply a kind of judgment to it and we see, so, you know, so, so um, uh, something isn't reverent uh, or, uh, or something is spiritually dead. Um, and we apply these judgments to it mainly because it's being offered to us in a form that we're not familiar with or we don't like. And so it's learning to make those sometimes quite fine distinctions. Um, uh, but I think that's not a very good answer, but I think that's a really good question. <laughs> just want to follow that question up a little bit, maybe almost flip it. But first of all, thanks for your lecture tonight. And you warmed my heart by referencing Wesley at Aldersgate. So. Uh, I just want to, thinking about, and it's probably true in Scotland as well, but we're seeing uh, just, I mean, Atlantic Canada has not been a culturally diverse place really, but it's starting to happen. And it's quite exciting to see. And I think more and more people in our, are, are finding their way into our churches from all around the world. And so you see people coming uh, who probably coming from a culture that maybe is more expressive uh, maybe a theological bent that's more charismatic and and finding ways for churches that are very Baptist in terms of wanting to be more cerebral and a little more quiet uh, how do you how, how do we work together as you you were just referencing um, welcoming one another and maybe being willing to give a little on you know our preferred ways of expressing worship or you know, because I think there's a great opportunity if you have a, a good biblical literacy and, and a good hermeneutic 
to somehow marry that maybe with a bit more of an effective or expressive type of Christianity. I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. Yeah, I mean, th there are some real challenges associated with that, I think. And, and um, on the one hand, that, that in local communities, the desire to have a, a, a keep a unity within a congregation, uh, there's a pressure to hold everybody within one space. But on the other hand, I think sometimes there, there are tensions and preferences within churches which can't always be accommodated. Uh, so, so kind of in, in uh, missiology and congregational studies, people sometimes talk about either blended worship or menu church. So blended worship is where you try and fit a range of styles into one service and you try and keep all the people, please all the people, you know, in, in, in the one act of worship. And uh, menu church is where you begin to say, listen, we can't hold all of this expressive diversity within one act of worship and therefore we're going to have to create some different spaces. So um, the classic example of this thing in the UK was, I think, in the Anglican church. Um, uh, as the charismatic renewal came through in the 60s and 70s. And so what you would get in the Church of England often was you would get an ATM communion service uh, where they used the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. And then you would get a family worship at 11 o'clock uh, where people kind of played the organ and sang hymns and uh, there was lots of families and kids there. And then, you know, uh, at six o'clock in the evening, you would have a worship band playing contemporary worship music. And each of those had a different aesthetic and a different emotional uh, style to them, if you like. And people then held that together within one parish uh, in the Church of England. Now, if you're not a parish church in a parish system, um, those things uh, Lead, can lead to what in North America more than in the UK has been called the worship wars within congregations where people are, s uh, uh, and again, you want to understand the worship wars, you've got to talk about feelings because these things uh, produced enormously strong emotional reactions in people. Uh, if you want to, uh, to start to, to work out uh, the emotional geography of a congregation, uh, try suggesting some changes in worship um, and, and see how people react. And there are reasons for that because that goes very deep down into people. And also, those are the ways in which people have experiences of the presence of God. And if you start to mess with them, the danger is that people begin to feel that you're messing with their capacity to encounter God. And, and they develop very visceral reactions to that. Um, now, I just don't think there aren't any easy answers uh, to that. I mean, I think you need good teaching. I think you need peacemakers in the church. I think you need good communication. Um, uh, I think you need to be able to stand up to bullies. Uh, there's all sorts of things you need to be able to do within the life of a church. And sometimes you need to uh, be able to have more than one service and say, we can't accommodate. I mean, it, just imagine, you know, if you're all trying to choose a film to watch from Netflix and you've got the whole family there and if there's two or three generations, it can be pretty difficult to agree on something. And sometimes you just can't hold all that diversity together. And that's okay. Uh, and maybe you could have diverse expressions as long as there were other times in a church when uh, uh, people came together to eat together, for example, or they maybe came together for other kinds of teaching or fellowship. So we don't necessarily always have to do everything uh, uh, the, the same. I, mean, I think that um, cultural diversity is introducing um, uh, you know, significant challenges. And, and in the UK, in many places, it's been a massive source of renewal um, of, of the church. Um, uh, and and uh, you know, I thank God for that. And you know, so my experience of, of going at 21 to live in the East End of London and going to a church that became a black majority church was hugely formative for me. Uh, and I'm very, very enormously grateful for those experiences and for what that taught me um, about um, how limited my cultural experience of church had been uh, up to that point. Yeah, I'll pick up a couple online. I'm just thinking now you're talking about feelings as creating some strong feelings in me, uh, which, which in itself is interesting. But uh, Anna, I'll... Uh, we have uh, a question from online, and the question is this. Uh, so essentialism is a philosophy that basically says if it feels good, do it. If you feel it, it's real for you. And some Christians argue that it is to blame for people who are 
born one gender, choosing to live another gender, and so on. And these Christians tend to be quite judgmental about that. So how do we reconcile a distaste for that essentialism that comes from how you feel and making it real? How do we reconcile that with these kinds of ideas that feelings are in some way essential to our being? There's a lot in there, I know. Have fun with that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't know. I think this is a new thing uh, that, that many folk in, in churches are, 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 are facing and, and people in different areas of society are, are, are uh, facing. And I think it's causing a lot of confusion. Um, and um, I don't think it's going to be settled, particularly in, in, in the actual personal experiences by people uh, writing one theory particularly hard. I think the first thing to do is to be kind and respectful towards people and I think to listen to them and, and allow people to talk uh, so that we can understand. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and, and uh, of the issues uh, around this um, phenomenon in our society and, and quite what it means and, and um, uh, And I think it does raise powerful questions. Um, in a sense, one of the things I was trying to say tonight was that some very profound philosophical questions are being raised by this turn to focus on emotion. And I think that's maybe been a bit surprising for people because actually you tend to associate philosophical arguments much more with um, a kind of intellectual um, uh, take, on, take on the world and, and you know, who's got the right ideas about something. And it's interesting that in the wake of all the, 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 the turbulence of, 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 of how people began to think about the instability of language and meaning in post-modern debates, this turn to emotion um, has, has, has begun to um, uh, raise these questions about how we get in touch with uh, what is real and so the questions about the materiality of the world, uh, the questions about em empirical phenomena and about experiments where reality gives us feedback um, are, are significant. But then, in some ways, this is, a, I think that's why this is such a, a, a kind of interesting and confusing phenomenon where, in a sense, someone says, my emotions and, and, and the cognitive aspect of my emotions mean more than everything else that you might see or, 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 or a scientist might tell me about my body. I think that's a really unusual thing to have people say. Um, and if, if increasing numbers of people are saying that in our society, as I say, I think first of all, we, be, we're, we should be kind, we should be respectful, we should listen to people. Um, uh, I mean, in, in my, as a student, we've got, we've got trans students at Glasgow and for most of them, the journey that they have gone on has been unbearably difficult. The social cost, the family cost that they have gone through. And so one of the things I want to say is, you know, you know um, why has, how has this been so important to you and how are your convictions about this so deep um, you know, that you're willing to pay this price for, for these beliefs? Um, and I need to honour that, at least the price that they have paid, you know. And, and, the, and people who are, who are on a daily basis almost getting ridicule uh, in many cases and getting abuse both online and in person. Um, but I think it, it poses some really deep questions uh, for us. And it's been interesting for me as well because those questions, you know, the, the battle lines around same-sex relationships, back in Scotland anyway, I don't know about here, but I guess it's the same here, are pretty well formed and people are either on one side of the debate or the other. What's interesting is that people don't quite know how to treat this issue around trans people because it's not the same issue. It's not the same issue and so they don't have the same texts and scripture to go to and say, this is about the authority of scripture and you're wrong. People are going, this is just very confusing for me. I don't know. I don't know how to. So the Vatican has issued some quite strong uh, guidance about it recently, where it's taken a rather conservative position on it. Um, and, and, and I think some evangelical groups are doing the same. Um, but um, it's a different issue, and it requires a different response. Um, but, 
it's it's yeah it's it's confusing and and, and um, uh, I think it does raise these profound questions about how do you how do you know what is real as well you know and I think we're going to be wrestling with those for a while okay what is real I think we're going to pull it in there uh, there there is some uh, refreshments available tonight so you will have a, a an opportunity to continue in the conversation if you if you want to speak to Doug personally and uh, maybe there was something you said I don't want to ask this in front of other people because getting up at standing at that microphone can feel a little bit awkward so I'm sure he'll give some more of his time to do that whether we have uh, some uh, uh, some refreshments. So again, Doug, you, you have raised a huge number of issues that even I'm trying to process. Uh, those of us who teach, uh, I'm sure, are imagining what does it mean if we put the fuel back into our discipline? How will that change that? How will that impact it? I, I know Matt at the back there is thinking through all these Hebrew words to do with feelings. Uh, and, and, and I think it's a, whether, whether we are should we all follow those birds? I don't know. So I, I find that a fascinating uh, area that's been raised for us and it'll be really interesting to see how this unpacks over uh, the next couple of nights. So we thank you again. So please. <laughs> and uh, let's pray together. Lord God, we acknowledge before you that sometime the highest moments in our life is when we feel things. We, we acknowledge, Lord God, that the, these emotions both relate to you and, and to others. We also confess that at times we kind of want to shy away from what, what is the status of this? What, what does that mean? What how does it refer to the real? Help us as we continue to think about that, to, to unpack it. Help us as we continue to think about that, to receive your wisdom. Lord God, do we even dare to pray, help us as we think about that, to experience your presence. So Lord, take us and hold us, keep us safe in the complexity of our human lives. And as those who desire to serve you, help us to understand better as we engage with a number of these issues that touch upon so many areas. Continue with us. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>